Hey, everybody, this is Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm reading the Bible through in one year. Today is day 135 of our 365 day Bible reading plan. I'm so glad that you're here with me on this journey and that I'm not reading it alone. I have found such incredible encouragement just in and of myself, reading comments that people leave below, knowing that this journey, a journey of faith. We're in it together. I think we're stronger together. I know that we are in faith because where two or three are gathered together in his name, he is there. God's bigger than the internet. He is here in the name of Jesus. Before I begin, check out the resources linked below. They're complimentary to each day's reading. If something comes up from the way of the worshiper where I've already done a journalism style devotional blog article or a word study, on a topic that comes up that we're reading for the day, I'll link it down below, as well as a reflection sheet that you can print out if you want to just dig deeper or tuck it in your Bible or something as you go ahead. Make a point to hit the thumbs up button underneath this video. It keeps you accountable. It creates a habit for you to come back and continue on in the journey of God's word every single day. We're going to open with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Thank you for the reading of your word. Father, I lift my hands to you with my brothers and sisters in Christ right now as an act of faith, as an act of submission, as an act of worship, declaring that you are good, that you are worthy of praise, that we rely on you. We let go of the things we've been holding on to so that you can give us what it is you know we need. We willingly open our hands freely to you, Father, and cast our cares and give you our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's get right into the reading today. Reading today in our Old Testament reading, 1 Samuel 15 and 16. We started the book of 1 Samuel with Samuel's origin story. He told a little bit about his own background and his mother was infertile and she, and she was able to have him and she dedicated him to the work of the temple. He had the vow of the Nazarite. Eli, the priest, had two corrupt sons, Hopni and Phineas. And now Samuel, has is who's the one writing 1 Samuel, had to write about his own difficult journey with his his sons, after the calling of God was so powerful on his life, his two sons, Joel and Abijah, they were taking bribes. And it was because of their example that the people finally said, we're done being ministered to and served by a priest because they're just as corrupt as anybody else. We now want a king. And it was the breaking point for them that caused the people to cry out, to reject God as their king and to demand an earthly king. That was kind of a disappointment for Samuel, I'm sure, when he had to sit down and pen this a painful part of his story. So now Saul has been instituted as king. They have gone into several battles, but Saul has made a major mistake. He was told by Samuel to wait for an appointed day and time that before they went into battle, they were going to offer a sacrifice. That was Samuel's legal obligation as the person who ministered in the tabernacle. So now Saul got impatient. And my I was noting this morning, while I was rereading that account from yesterday. He got very nervous about waiting. And because of that, he ended up, uh, the Bible says, when Saul makes an excuse to Samuel, who said, you've acted foolishly. And Saul says, I forced myself to offer sacrifices because you didn't come at the time I thought you were going to come. So God has now said to Sam through Samuel, I am no longer continuing on with Saul's legacy and dynasty. I will raise up a man after my own heart. So the last thing we read yesterday was about Saul's Sam uh, family, who his sons were, who his daughters were. And Samuel has made a note here that there was war with the Philistines all the days of Saul. So now here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you to be king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts. I remember what Amalek did to Israel and how he laid in wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not have compassion on them. But put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep and camel and donkey. So Saul summoned the people together and numbered them in Telaim. 
200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. Then Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid an ambush in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, go depart, go down from the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you show kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Then Saul struck the Amalekites from Havilah until you come to Shur, which is near Egypt. He took Agog, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But, but, Saul and the people spared Agog and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, and the lambs. And of all that was good, they were not willing to utterly destroy them. But everything that was despised and weak, they completely destroyed. Then came the word of the Lord to Samuel, saying, I regret that I have set up Saul to be king because he has turned his back from following me and he has not carried out my words. And it grieved Samuel and he cried to the Lord all night. When Samuel arose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told to Samuel saying, Saul came up to Carmel and set himself a monument. And then he turned and has passed on down to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the word of the Lord. Samuel said, Then what is the sound of this flock of sheep in my ears, and the sound of cattle, which I'm hearing? And Saul said, Oh, they've brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. There's a little Easter egg in here. I want to underline with my pen for when I come back later. This is exactly the same verbiage that we saw back in Jacob's day. Do you remember, if you've been with me through all of these readings through the book of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham was a servant of the Lord. He worshiped the Lord. He built tabernacle. Uh, he built um, altars to the Lord. He No one had to even tell him to do it. He did it out of his own willing heart. Isaac, same thing. Yeah, they had their troubles. Of course, lots of people have troubles. We're all a mess except for God's mercy. And so Isaac had his own troubles, but he loved the Lord. He was a worshiper of the Lord. However, when we get to Jacob's account, he used some very interesting language where he repeatedly said throughout his early days to his father and grandfather, the Lord, your God, the Lord, your God, the Lord, your God. He never personalized the word of God to himself, the name of God. It was never my God, my God. It was always your God until Jacob wrestled with that angel. And he said, you're not going to leave until you bless me. He has this amazing encounter with God. And from that point forward, he, God changes his name to Israel, gives him that new nature. Remember, deception had been a through line through that entire family. They all had been deceivers. He gives Jacob this new nature. Going forward, Jacob uses the language immediately shifts as a journalist and a writer. That's something that the language always stands out to me, especially in the Bible, because none of these words are errant. They're not wrong. They're not random. They're not haphazard. They weren't just thrown in there. They mean something. And so he is. He begins to say, the Lord, my God, the Lord, my God. Saul just said to Samuel something very telling that I'm going to underline. So it pops out to my eye the next time I read it. Samuel is saying, the, Saul says, I have served the Lord and I did everything that the word of the Lord told me to do. And Samuel says, then why am I hearing the sound of ox and every, everything should be dead? So Saul says to him, I have brought them from the Amalekites, the very best, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. That is an important word, and I'm going to circle it so I don't miss it later. The Lord your God, he says. He did not personalize the phrase, and that is a big deal. It's very telling of the kind of character that is in Saul. And one of the things we saw in a few of the readings a few days ago was that Saul was a coward. At his core, he was a fear-based person and it influenced all of his decisions. And sometimes fear causes you to run and hide, which Saul did on the day of his coronation. He was hiding amongst the armor. It also causes you to seize power and control because fear makes you feel like you're not in control. And so you misuse control and power. 
And Saul has repeatedly made several decisions already in his kingship that show that he is seizing control and power over God. Repeat That was in yesterday's reading when he said, I decided to do this. Well, I decided to do that. And they were against God's decisions. Well, here we are. The Lord, you are God. We're going to sacrifice them. He thinks he's doing a great thing. I'm a big guy. I made the decision. We're going to sacrifice. I know God said to wipe him out, but we're going to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God. And the rest we've utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. And I will tell you what the Lord spoke to me this night. So he said to him, speak. Samuel said, when you were little in your own sight, were you not made the head of the tribes of Israel and the Lord anointed you king over Israel? And the Lord sent you on a journey and said, go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they're destroyed? Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? And why did you rush upon the spoil to do evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have followed in the way which the Lord has sent me. And I have brought Agog, the king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took from the plunder of sheep and oxen and the first fruits of the banned things to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. I'm going to circle that again before we continue on. Dangerous language, especially for someone given a place of high visibility and authority. The Lord your God in Gilgal. Samuel said, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Obedience is better than sacrifice. A listening ear than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the lord he has also rejected you from being king saul said to samuel ah i i've sinned for i have transgressed the commandment of the lord and your words because i i feared the people and i obeyed their voice now therefore please pardon my sin and return with me that i may worship the lord Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go, he seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who's better than you. Also, the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Let's get the highlighter out and grab that one. Woo. In my Bible, the word strength there is capitalized. He's referring to the spirit of the Lord that came upon Saul at different moments throughout his kingship to partner with him and bring him forward, even though it wasn't even God's ultimate plan. He didn't really want them to have a king. He wanted to be their king, but he continued forward with them. Now I'm going to underline this for the also the strength of Israel, capital S, the strength of Israel will not lie or repent. He is not a man that he should repent. That'll preach. Those are some serious words that he's speaking here. Now Saul is talking and then he said, I have sinned, yet please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel and turn back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring me Agog, the king of the Amalekites. And Agog came to him reluctantly, but Agog said, surely the bitterness of death is past. Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agog in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went up to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house, Gibeah of Saul. Now Samuel did not see Saul up to the day of his 
death. But Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. That's a heavy thing when the Lord regrets something that he did and may, wants to make a different choice. He already, he's said several times now, he already has another plan in place. It's not a plan B. With God, everything's plan A. It's we who decide how the plan is employed going forward. And we know from the book of 2 Timothy that fear is a spirit. And it came upon Saul and it affected everything he did. He allowed himself to be led by that. So God has a plan in place. He has a man after his own heart. Now we're in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Then the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him from ruling over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have chosen a king for myself. From among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go if Saul hears it? He'll kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Call Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. And you will anoint me him whom I tell you. Samuel did that which the Lord spoke and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come in peace? That's because Old Testament prophets often brought a difficult word that people knew they were in trouble. They did something wrong. And when, even when they came in good times or they came to do a powerful work of the Lord, the people were constantly trembling because they were living in a perpetual state of simmering idolatry. And he said, I have come in peace to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and said, surely the anointed of the Lord is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance, nor on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, for the man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. So Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are these all your young men? And he said, there remains the youngest. And there he is shepherding the flock. Then Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and a good appearance. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him for that is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord terrified him. So the servants of Saul said to him, see an evil spirit from God troubles you. Let our Lord now tell your servants who are before you that they, that they might seek out a man experienced in playing the lyre. And it will come to pass when the evil spirit from God is on you, that he will play with his hand and all will be well. Saul said to his servants, find me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then one from the servants answered and said, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is experienced in playing music, a mighty man of valor, a man of battle, and skillful in words, even a man of fine appearance, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, who's with the sheep. Jesse took a donkey laden with bread, a bottle of wine, and a young goat, and he sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and stood before him. Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. It happened that when the evil spirit from God came on Saul, David would take the lyre in his hand and play. So Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. That's the end of our Old Testament reading. So much is happening right now in the spiritual sense. This is one of the most spiritual accounts that we've read so far, where we see that there are evil spirits that are tormenting somebody like Saul because he's opened the door 
through his sin, the Lord has departed from him. He's brought himself out from God's presence like Cain did in the book of Genesis. He's departed from God's presence through his sin. It was a willful decision. And he's brought himself under the law of sin and death, where yes, spiritual torment is part of that experience. We know from the book of Ephesians that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of dark places. We know from the book of Corinthians that we can cast those things down from their place of authority through the name of Jesus Christ. But that's not where we are right here. But isn't it so interesting that David, who we know now, is a worshiper. David was worshiping among sheep before he ever worshiped in a congregation or before he ever worshiped as a king. He was worshiping alone amongst sheep. That's what made him. And Jesus is the good shepherd. A lot's tying in here, but this is what made David so attractive to the Lord. No one had to tell him to do it. It didn't matter what he was going through. He was worshiping the Lord. He was renowned for being skillful in wor words, playing music, a mighty man of valor and a man of battle. And at this point, he's still just the youngest. The Hakatan, the worthless youngest son. He had no value, even in his father's eyes, in the pecking order of his family. He had a great value in God's eyes because he was a worshiper. Worship is a spiritual weapon of war. And I'm going to link down below to a resource where you can continue to study what it looks like to wage war with worship. Worship wins wars. The victories that we see through worship are inside of us. We see them within us first before we tend to see them outside of us. But the battle has got to be won within. Otherwise, what does victory look like if we ourselves have not won first? Take a look at that below. We're going to go over to the New Testament. Reading today, John chapter 8 verses 1 through 20. When we last left off, Jesus had just stood out at the Feast of Tabernacles and he had cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. For he who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He was talking about the Holy Spirit and people were very upset by that because he had also called himself the bread of life. They didn't want to hear about that either. Nicodemus questioned amongst the Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders. And when they were trying to capture Jesus and arrest him, Nicodemus, who had had a great conversation with Jesus in John chapter three, said, does the law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? But then they accused him of not knowing the books of the law and the prophets. They said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. They were incorrect about where the prophet, the Messiah would rise out of. He was out of Bethlehem. And they did know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but his father, Joseph, was not registered in Bethlehem, although that was the registry of his birth, as we know, when they traveled there to Bethlehem. But they went down into Egypt afterward as they fled Herod, who wanted to kill Jesus. And so they're unaware of Jesus's origin. They don't really care, but they're unaware of it. And Nicodemus dared to speak out. So now here we are in John 8, 1 through 20. Then everyone went to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he returned to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. When they had put her in the middle, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Now Moses in the law commanded us to stone such, but what do you say? They said this, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. So when they continued asking him, he stood up to them and said, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Being convicted by their conscience, those who had heard it went out one by one, beginning with the eldest, even to the last. Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had stood up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And he said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees said, therefore to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your testimony is not true. 
remember in the books of the law, there had to be two or three witnesses. That's what they're referring to here, saying you cannot bear witness of yourself because there's got to be agreement where there is two or three witnesses. The Bible said several times in our Old Testament readings, a matter is established. They would have known that and Jesus would have known it too. Jesus answered them, though I bear witness of myself, my testimony is true for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet if I do judge, my judgment is true for I'm not alone, but I'm with the father who sent me. Even in your law, it is written that the testimony from two men is true. I'm the one who bears witness of myself. And the father that sent me bears witness of me. There's two. Then they said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know, neither me nor my father. If you knew, you would know my father also. Jesus spoke these words in the treasury as he taught in the temple. No one arrested him for his hour had not yet come. Jesus gives as good as he gets because he was a master at the law and the prophets. He understood what he had come to do. And all these things he's speaking, we see now through a glass darkly. They had no idea, even though it was right in front of them the entire time. The father has already borne witness. The Holy Spirit has already descended on him like a dove. And what he said before is, if you don't even believe Moses, why would you believe me? That's the end of our New Testament reading. Let's finish up with a psalm and a proverb. Reading today, Psalm 110, beautiful psalm penned by David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send your mighty scepter out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will follow you in the day of battle on the holy mountains at the dawn of the morning. The dew of your youth belongs to you. The Lord has sworn and will not change. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall strike down kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill them with dead bodies. He shall scatter heads all over the land. He shall drink of the brook in the path. Then he shall lift up the head. Jesus quoted from this. This is one of these great through lines in the Bible. Jesus quoted from Psalm 110 when they were asking him about being the son of David when he called himself the son of David. And he said, why did why did David write? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. Such an interesting through line that we see there. This is kind of a violent psalm, but David is a man of war and a man of bloodshed. We will see that a little bit later in our readings in Samuel and in Kings and Chronicles that David was a man of war and bloodshed. And so the things that he's writing, they sound very violent to us. That was a simple, that was a simple fact of culture back in David's day. And we just saw that Saul and Samuel were complicit in hacking up Agog. God said he would not forget what the Amalekites did. And it's been many, many, many years since the Hebrews came out of Egypt. But God did not forget what they did after they betrayed the people of Israel when they were coming through the wilderness. And he came back for them. God always keeps his promises. Woo. Yes and amen. All right, let's finish up with a proverb. Reading today, Proverbs 15, 8 through 10. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who follows after righteousness. Correction is grievous to him who forsakes the way, and he who hates reproof will die. Another interesting through line here when he says, the way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, and the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But for the people of the Lord, the prayer of the upright is his delight. Yes and amen. That's the end of our day 135 Bible reading. I'm so glad you joined me today. I'm Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshiper. Check out the resources below for continued study. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button and check today off in your one-year Bible reading journey. We're going to close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you've done and are yet to do. I believe and I am fully persuaded, as Paul said, with my brothers and sister in Christ in this moment, that you do keep your promises. 
that you are not limited to time and space and human things, and that you are the one who called those things into existence, Father. So we safely put our trust in you to be the God that keeps promises, no matter how long it takes in our eyes. Father, help us to see our lives through the lens of eternity. We lift our hands to you and praise you, Lord, for you are good. And it's under your mercy that our mess lives. Thank you for your long suffering, Father, and your great compassion, that you're slow to anger, Lord, that your mercy extends, that your faithfulness reaches, Lord, to the clouds. All glory belongs to you, Lord. Show us today who we are and who you are and how we can better honor you moment by moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.